All right, I'll go ahead and get the meeting started for this evening. Thanks everybody for joining us and thank you for joining us again for our third <coughs> um, virtual winter seminar series. Um, my name is Jessica McLindsay and I'm working with Southern Maryland RCD here in Leonardtown. Um, a few of my other office mates are with us today. Um, Allison is going to be moderating, watching the chat uh, while I'm presenting. So in my spare time, I'm working on my PhD with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Biological Lab, and I'm going to be presenting the research that we're working on with climate ecology, conservation, and the northern diamondback terrapin. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and make sure everyone can see it okay. Give me just a moment. And I just wanted to let everybody know, hi, it's Allison. Um, if you have any questions throughout this at any point in time, you can either put them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll be watching and I'll go ahead and, and let Jess know that we have a question. Thanks, Allison. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yep. All right, great, thank you. All right, so tonight I'm gonna to be presenting what I've nicknamed climate ecology and conservation, the state of the Northern Diamondback Terrapin. I call it climate ecology because we're not just looking at ecology, which is the interactions that happen in the ecosystem between the species and their spaces. We're really looking at how climate is changing or affecting those interactions. And the species that we're studying is the Northern Diamondback Terrapin. But before I introduce you to the Terrapin, I know we've had quite a few younger members who have been joining us on these presentations. So I wanted to give just a little bit of the background of who I am and how I got to where I am. So it might help answer some of their questions or spark some motivation in some of them. So that's me. And this is one of the photos from the site that I work at. So I call that my uh, fire sunshine. We go out there at 5.30 in the morning to start watching for the diamondback terrapins. And it doesn't matter how tired you are, that view is just breathtaking every morning. One of my favorite quotes that I put on here is that knowledge generates interest and interest generates compassion. And that's from Doug Talmy. I like to continue that to also say that compassion generates action because I think that's the most important piece of all of this, we come full circle. We share knowledge, we generate that passion, but then that passion brings us to protecting species and spaces. And that's what this is all about. <clears throat> I have to pardon me, I'm having allergies towards something, so <clears throat> pardon me. So I started at the College of Southern Maryland here in, uh, actually started at the La Plata campus when I first started. Um, I got my scuba diving certification and started working at Petco because I absolutely loved animals, loved the water, loved everything science, and that's how I got my start. Uh, took some time off from school to raise some kids um, and then went back to the University of Maryland global campus and got my degree in uh, sciences and went to get my master's degree from Slippery Rock University. My master's is in education, but it's more specifically, it's in environmental education. So it's actually a science-based education degree. Um, during that same time, I became a Maryland master naturalist. So if any of you that are over the age of 18 are interested in the Maryland master, natural, master naturalist program, I highly recommend it. That's actually where I met my advisor for my PhD program. So lots of wonderful things, wonderful connections, wonderful networking, wonderful volunteer opportunities, and really supporting your local community. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, I was working at the Elms Environmental Education Center. Some of you may have been on field trips to the Elms. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I also did some work with National Geographic. I became a National Geographic certified educator and a grantee. So I built a website, worked on some education programs, connecting educators from around the globe so that they could share their experiences with other educators. Um, for example, someone from Australia could partner with somebody from Connecticut and they could share the history of their place, the people, the ecosystems, the animals. Uh, so it was a really great experience to be able to connect people from all over the world and really promote learning. Uh, after that, I got my job with Southern Maryland RCD in Leonardtown, where we do land conservation, shoreline restoration, we do environmental uh, uh, improvements in the Southern Maryland area, 
and at the Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Biological Lab is where I'm working on my PhD in ecology for the Northern Diamondback Terrapin. And this is the Northern Diamondback Terrapin. Many of you may have seen them. Uh, they are fascinating turtles. They're native to our brackish coastal areas. The, they love the marshland. So the area in between the sea and the forest where you have the marshlands with shorter grasses, they create a safe space for the terrapins to live. That's where they love to live. And they, they are the only turtle species in the world that's endemic to brackish water. So they can't live in fresh water. They can't live in full salt water like out in the ocean. They have to live in brackish water like the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they're seen along the Eastern shore from New England to North Carolina, but the species that we're studying, the subspecies is primarily found here in the Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they spend most of their life in water. So you may be thinking of sea turtles, like the loggerhead sea turtle that's huge. But these turtles are smaller than a dinner plate. The males are much smaller than the females. Um, females, uh, I don't know if you guys can see me. I think you can still see me. <laughs> uh, about this size. But males you'll find are about this size. Um, and the females have to be larger because they have to carry the eggs. And they have to nest and lay their eggs. <clears throat> uh, while they're living in the marsh, they love to eat periwinkle snails. If you've ever been to the marsh and seen the tall grasses growing, you'll see the periwinkle snails climbing up and down the reed grasses as the tide comes in and out. And that's the Northern Diamondback Terrapin's favorite delicacy. Uh, they also enjoy clams, mussels, or really any invertebrate they can get their hands on. Uh, they are long lived over 40 years. Um, females, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> mature around the age of seven and um, males mature a little sooner. The average weight is about half pound to one and a half pounds. Of course, the females are larger. So again, not too large. And the diamond, ter diamond diamondback terrapins are currently listed as vulnerable in the IUCN red list of species. So what that means is we are aware that the species is possibly in trouble soon. Um, you get near threatened, threatened, and then you get endangered species. So before we're, we're many steps before that, but we are having them listed as vulnerable means that we are aware that the species is facing trouble. Uh, and interestingly enough, the IUCN recognized that while they have the red list of species, which is very important to bring attention to the species, they really needed to bring attention to the spaces that these species are living in. Otherwise, we don't have a way to support them. So they also have a red list of ecosystems now. And if you look up the Chesapeake Bay in the IUCN red list of ecosystems, it's listed as critically endangered. And that's the last step in the endangered list, meaning that it is the most uh, vulnerable. Um, I shouldn't use the word vulnerable. They're, vulnerable is another word. It's the, the most at risk of collapse, basically. So we have to do all that we can to help protect the Chesapeake Bay, which in turn will also protect the Diamondback Terrapins. Uh, the picture here in the middle is an aerial view of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, for those that may not know exactly where we are, we are about right here in the Southern Maryland area but the diamondback terrapins live all the way up and down the Chesapeake Bay. This is again, the shoreline where we're doing our research. This one is one of the beautiful cotton candy skies in the morning. And all three of these diamondback terrapins in these pictures are uh, pictures that I've taken out in the mornings when we're out there and they're all females. So uh, those are all the moms that we've encountered while we've been out there. So you may be asking, well, what are the threats to the diamondback terrapin? Well, there's many. Uh, there's a wide range of threats that the Dimeback Terrapin are experiencing, but luckily threats that we can lessen and help improve their ecosystem and improve their health. Uh, the picture right here on the left is the space where I sit in the mornings when we're watching our Terrapins. And I can see this whole cove where the Terrapins come in and out looking for a safe nesting spot. And as you can see, this area is very vulnerable to sea level rise, vulnerable to erosion, because just on the back side of this photo is a marshland. So there's not much beach area here for them to nest on. Uh, 
One of the other threats that the Diamondback Terrapin faces uh, are from people uh, um, at our cars, not intentionally, but they have to cross the road sometimes to get to the safe spaces where they're trying to lay their nest. And, and there are different areas that have set up turtle crossings. So to try to bring attention to people that the Terrapins or other turtles also cross the road there so they can help keep them safe. Um, so cars are a, a large threat for terrapins. So anytime you're out in your car, especially in the springtime, early summertime, when turtles are looking for a place to nest, keep your eye out for turtles. The picture in the middle here is just an example of some of the erosion that's occurring at the site that we're working at. You can see this tree has slid down the cliff. Um, and keep in mind this path right here, we may see photos later, um, that path actually eroded this fall. So we had about a four foot pathway that we would walk along the shoreline and that whole path is gone. So erosion is a big problem um, as for, for the habitat for the diamondback terrapins. The picture here shows these orange rectangles on a crab pot. So crab pots are a large threat to terrapins because they put different types of meat inside the crab pot to attract the crabs in which also attracts the terrapins. Everybody loves a lovely snack, but the terrapins don't know any better. So they get inside, they get stuck, and they can't figure out how to get back out. So those orange pieces of plastic are called um, terrapin excluders or turtle excluders. So that way the crabs can still get in. So the fishermen can still crab, collect all the crabs that they need, but the terrapins won't get in and they won't get stuck. So interestingly enough, the commercial fishermen, which take up the largest percent of um, the crab fishing in the area, are not required to use turtle excluders. Only the private landowner that has a dock, it usually only has two to three crab pots out from their dock. They're the only ones required to use crab excluders, I'm sorry, turtle excluders. So in your travels, if you can help promote turtle excluders, they're only two to three dollars a piece. So any fishermen that can put turtle excluders on their pots will really help the Northern Diamondback Terrapin population. And not just the Terrapins, any turtle can get inside. So it will really help focus these crab pots for their intentions just to collect crabs. The picture here on the right, many of you may have seen this, some may not have. Now, and if you haven't, I suggest heading over to Solomon so you can take a look at this and see how it changes year after year. This is on the site of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences, Chesapeake Bay Laboratory. And this shows the climate change over the years, just in Solomons. So many states and countries and globally have produced these climate stripe graphs just to help give a visual to how climate is changing. The blues and whites are colder colors and the pinks and the reds are warmer colors. So you can see as we go from left to right, which is back in the past, to most recent, you can see how the temperatures are increasing. In increasing temperatures are a threat to diamondback terrapins because it's causing sea level to rise, which is then causing erosion problems. Um, terrapins also face predators. So the beach where we go to watch for the, uh, the northern diamondback terrapins is a beautiful beach and it's a protected space. So there's lots of activity out there. We see birds. In the mornings, I'll see bald eagles, ospreys, great blue herons. Um, cardinals, it's a very beautiful place to be, but we also see a lot of animal tracks. We can see raccoons, we can see foxes. Last summer there was an otter that joined us a couple times. So while all of this is beneficial to the ecosystem, those predators like the foxes and the raccoons are able to sniff out where the diamondback terrapin nests are and they have to eat too and they find the eggs. So we're working to protect the nests from predators to try to help more of the diamondback terrapins make it to hatching and then make it back out into the marsh. Uh, one thing that I did want to mention here in the very bottom paragraph. So rising temperatures <clears throat> causing sea level rise, erosion, habitat loss. But the other part about rising sea level is that the sex of the terrapins, whether they're male or female, depends on temperature. So they don't have X and Y chromosomes like we do that makes us male or female. It's all temperature dependent. And as the temperature gets warmer, they're all females. So you have to have cooler temperatures to have males. 
So as you can guess, as the global temperature continues to rise, we're going to eventually get to a place where the temperature only produces females. And that can be a problem for the reproduction and success of the species. So these are some examples of their habitat and their nesting sites. Um, this picture right here on the left doesn't really do it justice looking at it here on a screen. So that is one of the cliffs that's probably about 10 feet tall. So I took this picture standing straight up. That nest was about four feet off the ground, maybe five feet off the ground, and the cliff was a good 10 feet tall. Diamondback ter terrapins are so strong. I was very surprised to learn how strong these moms are when they're out there trying to build their nests. This northern diamondback terrapin mom climbed four feet up this cliff, positioned herself backwards, dug this hole behind her. The hole is about eight to 10 inches deep, laid her eggs in the hole, and then covered it perfectly. So we we dug the eggs back out, but it was covered perfectly. And then they climb back down and go on their way. So it puts a whole different spin on uh, <laughs> giving birth. So they're amazing creatures. The next picture here are some of their tracks in the morning. And that's what we use to try to figure out where their nests may be. If we go out when the tide is low and we can see their tracks, we follow them to see if we can see the nest. And you would think, Finding a nest should be super easy. It's probably just this pile of sand on the ground that the turtles pushed back together, but it's not. They are, it's like magic. They're magical workers out there. So imagine you had a handful of, let's say Cheerios. You had a handful of Cheerios and you took one Cheerio and pushed it slightly out of the way. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for a pebble that looks out of place. A few grains of sand moved out of place. They are able to flatten their nest perfectly. Again, so that hoping predators don't find it, hoping people don't find them. So we have to watch very carefully in order to try to find their nest. Hey Jess. Yes. We had a good question in the chat. So sure. Anne wants to know, um, gender once determined by temperature, does it remain constant or does it change? Oh, so that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So. Great questions. I haven't gotten to that part where I go into a little bit more detail, but I'll go ahead and explain because that's a great question. So during incubation, which you'll see down here, it takes around 50 to 55 days. So if they nest early June, July, 50 to 55 days later, the hatchlings will emerge. Well, we know that the middle part of that, so let's say around 25 days after, that is the thermal sensitive period. There's a period of time right in the middle that determines if they're male or female. And then once they have developed as male or female, they will stay male or female. So if the temperature, it gets colder or warmer before day 25 to 30, that's okay. If the temperature gets warmer or colder after day 30, that's okay too. We are concerned about that thermally sensitive period right in the middle, which triggers it actually triggered, it's very complex, a lot more complex than I thought it was. Um, it triggers hormones that the temperature itself actually triggers hormones and suppresses other hormones that will make them develop as male or female. So please let me know if I did not answer your question and I can go into a little bit more detail. No, thank you, you did. That's very interesting. Yeah, Hello. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And another interesting fact about that is that not all turtles behave in the same way. Some turtles have chromosomes like we do. They're, they're not X and Y, but they're chromosomes. So they are chromosomally determined to be male or female. The majority of turtles uh, have temperature dependent sex determination so that they are dependent on what the temperature is. And if you look through research all the way back in history, they have found that some turtle species were able to switch from one to the other, meaning they either switched from the genetic determination to temperature, or they switched from temperature back to genetic. Now, adaptations in ecosystems take a very long time. So we're, we're not talking next summer, the turtles are gonna have chromosomes. We're talking hundreds of thousands of years that this adaptation, we see changes in how the physiology works with the turtles. So as the climate is changing, 
And we know animals are amazing. They're able to adapt to all of these changes that they're seeing. But the problem is that the change is happening so rapidly, the adaptations won't be able to happen rapidly enough to keep up with the change. That's when the problem occurs. <clears throat> oh, let's see. So on average, when a mom lays her nest, she lays about 12 eggs. The nests are about 10 inches, six to 12 inches deep with the eggs about 10 inches deep. And the eggs are very, very brittle. They're very soft, but very brittle. So when we're looking for these eggs so that we can measure them and count them, and we put temperature loggers in their nest, we have to move the sand very, very slowly, very gently, so that you can feel for that first egg. So there's no shovels. We're not out there digging with shovels. We're on our hands and knees moving really slowly so we can find the eggs in these nests. And we wait for the moms so that we can see where they're laying their nest. And then we put these crates over them. All of these crates are here to protect the nest. So we take the eggs out, we measure the eggs, and we put temperature loggers in, we bury them back up just the way mom left them, right where mom left them, and we put a crate over top. And we've learned, you see how, mm, as you can see more of this one, but you see how far down these crates are. These are melt crates, so they're, they're a good you know, foot tall. Um, the predators do a really good job of digging under those melt crates. So we have to bury them a good six to 10 inches down so that the predators can't dig underneath them. And this is just a great example as to how many nests you can see in one location. This picture over here is even better. This area of beach could be covered with 30 to 40 nests by the end of the summer. To put it into perspective, um, Allison and I actually went over to the Eastern shore to help with another project. And we didn't see any terrapins when we were over there. And a few of the members over there were talking to us about how they found three nests or three turtles one year, and that's huge for them. And we want to celebrate every nesting site because every nesting site is important. But hearing that information really put it into perspective for me, just how unique and important this site is because we typically see 75 to 100 nests here every year. So that's huge. So it's really important that we protect this site for the terrapins. So another question you may be wondering is, well, how is sea level rise going to affect the terrapins? So this is a baseline photo right here showing nesting locations between 2013 and 2016 along the Patuxent River. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't say. The research site that I'm working on is the Patuxent River Naval Air Station. So we're right along the Patuxent where the Patuxent meets the Chesapeake Bay. So it's a very energy heavy system. We have energy coming down the Patuxent, we have energy coming up and down the Chesapeake Bay, and it's landing right here at this site. But you can see just how many spots there are. There's quite a few nests every year. So this is baseline data. And using GIS, if we go to a year, approximately year 2050, with one foot of mean high water mark sea level rise. So think of the, the average of where the high water mark is for high tide, and you add a foot to that. This is what that's going to do to their nesting sites. So you can see how some of the area, especially over here, this is the marshland right back here. And this marshland is really going to start inundating the shoreline where they're able to nest. And you can also see it starting to come farther ashore here. But by year 2100, with a three foot mean high watermark sea level rise, you can see what that's going to do to their habitat. So again, these are projections. This information was taken from NOAA sea level rise projections. We know that there are many variables that are going to impact how much sea level rise actually does rise and how fast it does and what year we see these marks by. But using current NOAA sea level rise projections, this is what we could expect at this site by the year 2100. And this shows a, a good 50% or more actually of the nesting sites unavailable to the terrapins. So what does this mean? Well, this means this just shows the importance of why we need to protect these habitats and help the species while they still have these ecosystems available because it will really help bolster their population before they're starting to look for other habitats. So this is some of the scientific information. So this it may 
may be uh, a little too complex for some of our younger audience, and that is okay. It was too complex for me when I first started too, so don't feel bad. Uh, this is just showing more of the data that explains what happens when we get to that thermally sensitive period and we're seeing a female bias or male bias or completely female or completely male. And as the global temperature increases, the amount of females that we see increases. This graph right here is showing hypothesized different hormones that we're looking for and if we see them in males or females. So you see these few names right down here, this AMH hormone, the SOX9, DMRT1, these are seen in male species. Aromatase, CRB, CRBP are seen in females. So we're trying to use this hormone information to see if we can help determine if they're male or females. And they, the hormones work a little bit differently in the terrapins. It's, it's not just if they have an estrogenic effect, they're female. The estrogenic effect also suppresses the testosterone effect and then vice versa for males. The testosterone effect is highlighted, but the estrogen is actually suppressed. So it's a very ebb and flow that you'll see of the hormones. You won't ever see a, an equal level or close to equal level of hormones. They're, they're quite opposite. And then this graph is showing that with the two degrees predicted raise in global temperature, 91% of the nests will be female biased and 82% will produce only females. So I did a lot of talking about what the terrapin is, where it lives, what we're trying to study. So now I wanna show you some pictures of what we're actually doing. So this is the fun part. So research involves field work. So that this picture right here is me in one of the nests. Typically, like I said, there's about 12 eggs per nest. We pull them out into one of these containers and then we work to measure them. We weigh them, we measure them, we put them back in the nest and then we put these loggers inside. The loggers are measuring temperature, they're measuring humidity and they're also measuring light because we're also trying to keep track of all of the variables that these nests are exposed to to try to determine exactly what's causing them to be male or female and what they're experiencing when they're male or female. And you can see just how small these eggs are. So uh, up some videos you'll see of loggerhead turtles, you know, the, their eggs are this big or other sea turtles, their eggs are really big, but these ones are really small, very small and delicate. The equipment that's over here, this is the scale. You can see one of the eggs on here. They have to get the scale level zero the scale out and put every little egg on top and measure each egg at a time. We measure it, we weigh, I'm sorry, we weigh it, we measure it, and then we put them back in the holes and we bury them back up with our equipment right here. And same as all of the other ones, we put a crate over top, we bury the crate into the sand so that the predators cannot come back and get that nest. Um, and these crates have been very successful in protecting the nest. Um, I've been, this, this will be my third summer going out with the field work and we have not seen these crates pulled up out of the sand. So they're actually working really well to protect the nest. And then what we do when we see mom lay the eggs, we know what day one is. So we count out 50 to 55 days and we'll come back and either take eggs back to the lab or to do more measuring in the lab or we'll release them there. Uh, and it's not just us out there. I should also mention the partnership with the United States Navy. They have an amazing crew of volunteers, the Student Conservation Association, so anyone that may be college age, right after high school, looking to get involved with um, paid internships or volunteer work. There are a lot of Navy members that also come out and help us monitor the beach. We help them monitor the beach. Uh, we're out there in the mornings, but the Navy volunteers are out there three times a day, at least morning, middle of the day, and nighttime. So we're always looking for new nests so that we can put crates over them and protect them and also write down what day one was so we know when to come back to set them free. Does anybody have any questions before I go to the next screen? We had one question in the chat. Um, someone asked what their lifespan was, but I believe someone already answered it, um, if they remember correctly, that it was up to 40 years that they saw on an earlier slide. Yep, over 40 years. So they're known to live quite a long time. 
Okay, and Brock has his hand up right now. So Brock, do you have a question? How long can turtles, like, like where can you find the eggs at? So that's a really good question. So when we first started looking, we thought it was just the sand. You've been to the beach, you played in the sand, and you're able to build sand castles and dig in the sand. We're thinking, that's pretty easy. The turtles can move the sand around and lay their nest, which they do. But they also will move farther inland from the beach to the area that's rocky. If you can see in this picture, there's lots of pebbles. It's actually quite rocky up here. And even for me, it's actually pretty hard to dig through that. But the turtles are so strong, they're able to dig through the rocks, dig through the sand, even roots. If there are tree roots in the way, this picture right here, you can see the tree roots. They can dig right through that and they'll lay in their nests, bury them back up. And we've also found, let me go back to this picture. This is the forest. They've made their way up from the beach. It's still sandy here, but there's soil right underneath this top layer of sand. So the terrapins at this site are already starting to adapt. If they can't find a spot at the beach, they're coming a little bit inland and going into the riparian forest, meaning the tree line right in between the sea and the deep forest area. And they're able to find places to nest in the forest, which is fascinating. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So this next slide is the research that we're doing in the lab. So every summer we aim to take about 10 of the nests into the lab. And when I say take, I mean, we watch for the mom to lay her eggs. We actually take mom, we measure mom, we weigh mom, we take a small blood sample from mom. And if she's not marked already, we mark the back of her shell. And we also put a little um, tag right under the skin on her leg. So if you ever, if you have a pet, like a dog or a cat, you've ever gotten a, a little chip put on them. So if they get lost, you can scan them and know who they are. It's the same concept. We do the same thing to the terrapins. So no matter where they, they're actually found, we can actually scan them and we can see if the same terrapins are coming back every year. So about 10 of those nests, we get mom, we get information from mom, we give her a little hug and then I set her back on her way. And then we dig up her nest, we weigh the eggs, we measure the eggs, and we actually bring them back to the lab with us on day one. And the reason why we do this is because we want to be able to control the temperature to see if we can find that precise moment where they're turning either male or female. This picture right here in the middle is one of those setups. This is one of the nests from the beach that we brought back to the lab. We control the humidity, we control the light, we control the temperature to try to make them mature as either all female or all male, and then work our way back to the middle to see if we can find that exact moment where they're turning male or female. This picture right here, is from the outside. So the, this is the outside of these incubators right here. Lots of computer work here. So if you're interested in uh, computer science or engineering and electronics, there's a job for you right here because I don't know how to work all that stuff, but we have people that do. <laughs> uh, here in the lab, again, we're measuring. This is the tool we use to measure actually the length and the width on the eggs. So we know how big they are. After the eggs hatch, the terrapins hatch, they're in all of these cups over here. This is about over a hundred little terrapins, maybe about 150 from inside the lab. And we take a teeny tiny little blood sample. So you can, you can see my fingers in that picture and the little container, that blood sample is itty bitty because they're itty bitty. The little hatchlings are oh, that big, some the size of a quarter. They're very small. So we can't take large blood samples. And we don't want to because we want to release the terrapins right back to where their mom had put them. So we take a tiny blood sample, put it in a centrifuge here, separate it in between its plasma and the red blood cells, and we put those in the freezer. And what we're trying to do is use those blood samples to find those hormones that I was discussing earlier to see if we can determine if they're male or female based off of this tiny blood sample. So right now, I don't have any results to share because as in the name of science, many times you have to repeat things um, because they don't work the first time or the second time, but you don't give up. It's part of science. We just have to keep trying until we get it right. We have many partners working with us. So we actually have partnered with the USGS. Um, they're actually trying to help us 
figure out uh, if they're male or female by do, using these tiny blood samples to look for horm hormones. Because again, it's a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be. So once we get some information on who's male and who's female, that will help us know a little bit better about the temperatures that we're using in the incubator in the lab, whether we need to adjust those warmer, adjust those colder, or how to get to that exact middle point where we can see if they're male or female. Does anybody have any questions on this slide before I go on? Okay. And this is one of the ones hatching as soon as we took them out that morning. So just look at the color patterns on them. They are absolutely stunning. And much like our fingerprints, their shell patterns and shell colors are not all the same either. Many of them have, it's the same basic concept, but many of them will show differences in the shell patterns and the shell colors. So as the terrapins get older and their shells get larger and you can really differentiate some of that beauty in their shell, some people who see them frequently are actually able to identify them just based on their shells. So all of the research we do, we do it in the name of conservation. So any turtle that we take back to the lab comes right back to where we found them. This picture right here is a GoPro we set up when we released the hatchlings and we put them right back at the marsh where the mom intended them to go. That way they have the best chance of survival. So to put this into perspective, the site that we're working at if it has 75 nests per year, and each nest has about 12 eggs, that's 900 hatchlings. And between the Navy and our lab, there's been about 10 years of conservation going on at this site. That's 9,000 hatchlings. Now, we know not all 9,000 of them survive, but we gave 9,000 a chance to survive that might not have otherwise had a chance. So that's huge in the name of conservation. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see here in this picture just how small they are. So for any of you who have seen Game of Thrones, this little terrapin made me feel like the mother of turtles one morning. As we release the terrapins, here she is right here. I say she, I don't know, could be he or she. Here it is right here. Um, it wouldn't leave with the rest of them. The rest of them walked right back to the marshland, but this one kept turning around and coming straight back to me and I had to keep pushing it back out to the marsh. So it's one of the most adorable things I've ever seen. Um, and I really value that all of the research we're doing to help bring attention to the Northern Diamondback Terrapin and help the species and help their habitat, these adorable little guys get a chance to live. And I should also mention the Northern Diamondback Terrapin is Maryland state reptile. So any of you who have heard of the Maryland University Terps, that's the Terrapins. Oh, Anne, I see you have a hand, go ahead. Hi, just a quick question. Um, so when the mother lays the eggs, then she basically abandons the nest over? Yep, yep. Her hard job was making it ashore, finding a safe space, digging her nest, laying the eggs, burying that nest back up, and then her job is done. She goes back out to sea and she does not come back to check on her babies. <laughs> um, but I should say also, finding the site that she feels safe and comfortable laying her nest is a much more involved process than I thought it was. The, the site where I sit in the morning where we watch them, we can see their tiny little heads come up above water as they're looking. They're looking for predators. They're looking for people. They can go back and forth, coming up to shore, going back out to sea, coming up to shore for two to three hours at a time trying to make sure the space is safe. So it's not just they swim ashore, this looks good, and they come ashore. It's much more involved than that. Two to three hours of back and forth before they decide if it's safe. And I've even had some of them come ashore. I'm super excited. I got one. She's going to lay a nest. And they'll just walk off the backside and go back into the marsh. Something scared them and they decided it wasn't actually safe. Or some of them will be out in the cove and never come ashore. They turn around and leave. So I'm hidden behind Phragmites. If anybody is familiar with the invasive species Phragmites, uh, it's doing me a favor there and helping keep me hidden. So they don't see me, but I see them. So 
watching their behaviors and learning their patterns has also been very interesting. So the moms just want to make sure they're safe because sometimes when they're in the middle of laying nests, sometimes that's when they're attacked by predators as well. So it's not just the nests that the predators attack them. The predators can attack the moms as well. Did that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Brock has his hand up. Brock, did you have a question? Um, what, how does turtles dig down? Like how long can they dig down in the sand with, with their eggs? I know, it's fascinating. So let me go back to one of these pictures of the moms so we can kind of... <clears throat> so this mom right here, you see how big her arms look right here? Her back legs, that's what she digs with. She digs with her back legs. And if, if this is the edge of her shell, her back legs stick out oh, a good six inches. So she's got really long back legs and they are really strong. If I'm holding one of them by their shell, if their head's here and I'm holding her shell, she can take her feet and kick my hands away, uh, like literally kick my hands away. So they're so strong in their back legs and they use their long legs to dig these holes. They're 10, 12 inches deep. And then they, they keep their bottom right in the nest, lay their eggs, and then she uses her back feet, picture it kind of like scoops. Like if you were going swimming and you were using scoops to swim, she does that just behind her and she scoops the sand back in, covers her nest and will actually pat it down and then off she goes. Yeah, go ahead, Brock. Did you have another question? Jeez, that is cool. I don't know how they do that. Yeah, or the moms that they're doing handstands. They're standing on their front feet, digging a hole, and laying a nest three to four feet up a cliff. So she's doing a handstand at the same time that she's digging a nest. So the it's just fascinating. The Go moms, ahead. The moms look like they have mustaches. They do, they do. <laughs> and they're very pretty colors too. Oh, this video is playing again, but that's okay. So I'll have to share too that this video is actually very rare to actually catch one of them in the process of hatching and get the complete video of them hatching. Typically, we'll see some of them start to hatch and then they stop, or we get there when they've already hatched. So we see, like in this case right here, there's a whole bunch of empty shells here and these terrapins already came out. But this morning, it was the perfect moment. We dug these eggs out. They were just starting to hatch and then they finished hatching right there in front of us. So that was a very magical moment to be included on. Brock, did you have another question? No, hang on, my hand, I forgot to lower oh. my hand. It's okay, no problem, thank you. So I wanted to tie this all together with a local climate resiliency and ecological restoration. Because we talk about protecting these ecosystems, protecting this habitat, but what does that actually mean? So this site where I'm doing the Terrapin research and many others are doing the Terrapin research is part of Pax River Naval Air Station. And right now there's a $6 million project funded by the Navy, the Department of Defense, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, all, all of these organizations chipped in to help protect this coastline. I like to say it's because they love turtles too, but it's also part of the Navy mission to help protect the military base. This picture right here is another example of just the amount of erosion that we're seeing. And this beach path right here, that's part of that path that's gone. That path isn't there anymore. So this restoration project is gonna be a living shoreline where they put some breakwaters offshore, they're gonna put in some sand and some plants and create new marshlands. So creating new habitat, protecting the habitats that, that's there. The breakwaters are to stop that wave energy because it's the wave energy that's coming ashore, creating these cliffs, creating the erosion. So this is just one example of when you bring attention to a vulnerable species and a vulnerable ecosystem, how many different players are willing to you know, come to the table and help protect these species and spaces. So ecological restoration, climate resiliency equals continued conservation success. This picture right here in the middle is an example of 
think you can tell from the picture, it's seagrasses completely pushed over. During one of the storms in the fall, we had gone back out and seen that the wave energy came ashore about 20 feet farther than it normally had. It knocked all the grasses over. It did bring new sand in with it. So it was also depositing sand, which can also be helpful, but it was also eroding and destroying some of the other habitat. The picture here on the edge is just showing some of the trees that have fallen off the cliff. Again, making it harder for the terrapins to get to the habitat that they have. This is another beautiful picture of the sunrise in the morning and a few more of the baby terrapins after they've hatched. So when you think of ecological restoration and you wonder how, it's protecting the shoreline through the use of nature-based solutions, such as green infrastructure projects, <clears throat> living shoreline projects that can help, help protect the habitat from storm surge, wave action, and ultimately erosion. Gray infrastructure, such as rock walls or breakwaters, are often using combination of green and gray, and it's going to depend on the funding and depend on the organizations that you're working with or the what you have available. And we call it green or gray, meaning if it's green, like your planting plants, you're planting trees. Those are green actions. Gray actions, you think of cement or think of rocks. And they've actually started coming up with another category of ecological restoration called blue because it's water-based. They want to create bodies of water. So they call that blue infrastructure. So the time is now. Use your voice to promote and protect. Use your skills to assist and uplift. And when you care, others will care. So if you have questions, this is my email. For those of you who are on social media, I share our Terrapin journey on Twitter if anyone would like to follow along. But I'm going to stop sharing. So if anyone has questions, I would love to take your questions. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation this evening. Thank you for letting me share our research, share the story of the Northern Diamondback Terrapins. We did have a question in the chat. So Shauna asked, how long can terrapins swim? Uh, do you mean stay underwater or do you mean just swim? I'm waiting for her to respond. It's okay. I mean, you would go ahead and answer both. Yeah, <laughs> so just swim. So just swim. a very long time. So the males don't come ashore to nest. They come... I'll say ashore, but they really just come to the marshland. So they come to the shallows because that's where they find the invertebrates. That's where they find the snails, the mussels, the clams. So they're in shallow water when they're feeding and finding these critters, or they can even find small fish when they're out to sea. But majority of their life is spent swimming. They'll, they'll rest in the shallows. Some of them will even go down and rest on the bottom if it's not too deep. The moms do get a break when they come ashore uh, after they lay their nest. They typically wait 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer before they've got the energy to go back out to sea. So I think they're really just taking a load off and putting their feet up for a few minutes. But I can't quantify exactly how long they swim for, but they swim for a very long time. Let me see the question here. Here we go. So that's a really good question. So I don't know the answer to that question. I wish we did know because it would make it a lot easier. <laughs> if we knew how to hide better, we would we would know exactly what we were up against. Um, I have I think it's more of visual based for them. So I've watched them really just scanning the shoreline. I've seen some come ashore where tiny sandpipers, so the little birds with little long legs that you see in some cartoons, running back and forth across the beach, the sandpipers will scare them. And we know sandpipers aren't threatening, but it's motion. So it's basically anything that they see moving. Uh, they're used to the wave action. They're used to like the plants moving, but anything other than that, the motion can trigger them. So like where, where I'm at, if I need to stand up for a second, we're done, they've seen me. So we it's the motion that they notice. But that's a really good question. Um, it's I think it's something that everyone is working to try to understand a little bit better. <coughs> Excuse me. So by hibernate, not typically like we think of when we think of bears hibernating. So they don't come ashore in the winter. So they do find a place in the marshland 
when I say ashore, I mean, they don't actually come up onto the beaches or come up into the forest. They're going to find a place in the marshlands where they feel safe, they feel protected, and that's where they're going to stay all winter. Rock, did you have a question? I see your hand up. Um, I know that turtles can swim like underwater for really deep, but where mm -hmm. can they live? So that's a good question. So we call it living in the marshland. So that's technically where they live, but they will swim out into the middle of the river. They'll swim out into the middle of the bay. They can travel up and down the bay. So they can swim a lot farther than we can. So they can swim miles and miles and miles up and down the bay, but there's going to be a marshland somewhere that they call home. And that's where they're going to return to. We have a turtle I'm sorry, a terrapin that my advisor has been seeing over the last six or seven years. It's the same one. We also mark, we put um, almost like a hole punch. Think of a hole punch right on the edge of their shell. It doesn't hurt them, but it helps us identify them based on where those holes are. Um, and there's one he's seen at least the last six years. So we know they come back and we know they, they have habitat that they prefer, probably because they feel safe. Um, it's lots of protected spaces, quiet spaces. Um, the place that we went over on the eastern shore where we didn't see very many terrapins, it was very busy. Lots of boats, lots of people, lots of commotion. Uh, but our space, while there are boats out in the Patuxent River around Solomon's Island, they don't come really close to the shore. So I think the terrapins here feel really safe. Like, I seen a turtle from like an ocean and then it's like, it's like a... I forgot what I named it. It's like, it's brownish. And it's kind of a bit like a lightish brown. Mm -hmm. I've seen like three of those at my, in my woods and at a beach and sometimes in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. Turtles are fascinating, aren't they? Yeah. They look kind of bit like my favorite second animal. Well, my favorite animal is dogs though. Dogs. We have a dog too. I love dogs too. That's a good one. Yeah. Thanks for your question, Brock. Good question. Thank you. So I see the question in the chat. Are there more females in areas farther south where the climate is warmer? That's a great question and great connection there. I love that question. So interestingly, the thermally sensitive period where we learned that there's a temperature that triggers male or female changes geographically. So it depends on their latitude. So we see that the terrapin species farther north, say in the you know, Long Island area, New York area, they're going to have a different trigger for the temperature than species down in Georgia than our species here. So they do have a natural adaptation to the climate that they're used to living in. And that's great, great for each subset of species. Wherever they're located, they have temperatures that help them regulate their population. So there'll be females, there will be males, same thing as in the, you know, the Northeast or the South. The, the problem is that when the changing in temperature, see how quickly the warming is happening, they're not going to be able to keep up and adapt to that temperature change. So that is a great question. And there may be more females because it does get warmer, but because their trigger temperature is also different, I'm not exactly sure what the ratio of male to female in the overall population is. I just know that each different subset is actually adapted to the temperature range that they live in. Great question. Oh, that's a great question too. So the, the theory uh, comes, so the, the turtle species that had genetic determination that switched to temperature the theory behind the reason why that those species switched was because that they were reacting to the need for an adaptation, whether it be that genetically they were producing more of, of what more female or more male, something triggered the species to have that natural adaptation. So the reason why that they have species now that are temperature dependent is this the same concept. They think that it was a natural adaptation to changes that they experienced, whether it be environmental changes, climate changes, uh, people or predator changes, 
the species was having a better reproductive success by having temperature dependent. But as we see, climate change is something that we've We've never experienced to this magnitude before as far as the rate of acceleration, neither have these species. So even though they were able to adapt and change, we don't know if temperature dependent sex determination is going to be what's going to fit these spe the species right now in today's time. Any other questions? I really enjoyed all of your questions and all of your things that everyone had to share. So thank you so much for being interactive and keeping this fun and interesting for me as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And please feel free. Um, I will screen share real quick one more time. Please feel free to write down my email. If anybody has questions or wants to continue the conversation, I would love to email you back. Or if you want to follow our turtle journey, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. Um, we start out in the field around May. So you're going to see lots of new turtle pictures. And by August and September, we'll have new baby terrapin pictures. So I always enjoy sharing those. So thank you again for having me. Jessica, thank just you. To I'm, I don't want to keep anybody online, but would, hypo, would it be hypothetical then that if there's more females than males, that there's a chance in the future that they won't have enough males to fertilize the eggs over? Hypothetically, yes. And I think that's what we're trying to understand a little bit better. So if we can figure out exactly what that trigger temperature is that causes all females or all males, we can help protect the species by creating shade structures or planting trees in areas where there are no nesting sites like ours, where there's 75 to 100 nests every year. If we knew that this temperature this year is going to be too hot for these nests, we could put up shade structures to help help the species while it's trying to naturally adapt, we can help support the species. So in theory, it could eventually get to a point where it's all females. Granted, we know species are able to adapt and that's what we're hoping to see. When you think of the last glacial maximum, you know there were glaciers in Pennsylvania, so not too far from here, and the species survived. So they, they are able to survive extremes. I think the problem is just how fast this extreme is happening. So that's why it's important for us to help them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can I go now? Yeah, you sure can, Brock. Thank you. Have thank a good you. night. Bye. 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 Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. If you have questions, you're welcome to stay on. If you're ready to head out and get ready for bed, you're welcome to do that too. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.